Okay, in this video I want to turn to talking about the philosophy of science in the 20th century. And to do that we have to, of course, turn back to the very the late 19th and the early 20th century and talk about a school of thought known as logical positivism. Uh, philosophy of science in the 20th century, in particular in the early half of the 20th century, was dominated by logical positivism and later on as sort of more moderate descendant logical empiricism. Uh, it, it really flourished for several decades and, and, and dominated the philosophical scene in, in both philosophy of science and philosophy in general. Uh, but by the 1950s and then later on the 1960s, um, problems started to accumulate. And, and, and by the end of the 60s and going into the 70s, it was pretty much decisively rejected. Uh, I do not know of any uh, professional philosophers who maintain to logical positivism today, although there are some people who uh, hold on to sort of you know remnants of a, of, of a sort of a somewhat positivistic view. Um, it, it's something that has uh, mutated and morphed in response to several problems and can't properly be called logical positivism or, or even logical empiricism anymore. So I want to trace both the rise and fall of logical positivism in this portion uh, of, of my video series on the philosophy of science. But even though uh, logical positivism has been discredited, uh, you can't really understand where the philosophy of science stands today unless you understand this history. So it, it, it's important to go over logical positivism, not so much because it's thought to be right anymore, but rather because you can't understand where we are if you don't understand where we've been. We learn an awful lot in philosophy by looking back at our past mistakes. So let's uh, start understanding logical positivism by looking back even prior to the 20th century and looking back at uh, what we can call classical empiricism. Now, classical empiricism uh, is something that's typically uh, dominated by what are the three big British empiricists. And you probably know what empiricism is in general. It's the idea that all knowledge both comes from and is justified by sense experience. This is an idea that has you know, precursors in people like Aristotle, um, some of the medieval scholastics put this idea forward. Um, a, a French philosopher in the 16th century by the name of Pierre Gassendi sort of anticipates this idea. But, for, but the most mature, sophisticated, and developed version of this thought comes from 18th century British philosophers. Uh, and, and typically, the, again, the so-called big three in this field are, are Bishop George Berkeley, uh, David Hume, the Scotsman, uh, and, of course, John Locke. Uh, John Locke's really the father of British empiricism, and then Berkeley and Hume sort of pick up where he leaves off. Now, all three of these men are fascinating thinkers, uh, and they deserve a fair amount of attention in their own right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be coming back to, to talk a little bit more about Hume in the, in the next section of this, uh, of this series. Um, but for today, I want to focus primarily on, on Locke, since he is, the, like I said, the father of, of, of British empiricism. Now, to fully sort of grasp what empiricism is trying to do, you have to understand that it's, it's reacting to what might be called classical rationalism. Rationalism in this context is the idea that knowledge comes from and is justified by not experience, but rather reason, pure reason, reason in itself. Uh, rationalists think that reason can give us access to the deep, profound, metaphysical truths about the fundamental structure and nature of reality itself. It can tell us what the world is, quote-unquote, really like. Now, probably two of the uh, best examples of classic rationalists are Rene Descartes and Plato. Both of them thought that, you know, that you can't really trust reason, uh, kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi says, your senses can deceive you, you shouldn't trust them. Instead, we should rely on reason and reason itself. Reason, when, uh, when done properly, never leads us astray, Descartes and Plato both think. Um, quick qual qualification, by the way. Today, when people talk about being rationalists, usually they don't mean the sort of rationalist in this classical sense. They typically mean uh, that just that they have confidence in the power of human reason uh, and, and, and the abstract in the general sense to, to understand the world. Uh, not that all reason is, uh, not that all knowledge is justified by reason. Um, so again, I wish I could say a little bit more about the rationalists, but for now I just want to put this basic idea out there because this is what was sort of in the air when the, the British empiricists were sort of flourishing and, and coming of their own. And like I said, I want to focus in, uh, in particular. So two central questions of empiricism that I want to focus on are these two. First and foremost, how do you know? 
This is a question that the empiricists would ask incessantly. Anytime anyone makes a knowledge claim, that, or anytime they say, I know that God exists, or I know that evolution is true, or I know anything, whatever it is that they, someone's claiming to know, their immediate response is going to be, how do you know? And the only answer to that question that they would accept is some sort of reference back to some kind of experience, something that you can point to, something that you can repeat, something that in principle at least you could share with others. And according to the rationalists, when you subject the metaphysics of people like Plato and Rene Descartes to this sort of test, then they fail miserably. The, 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 the sorts of uh, uh, things that Descartes and Plato appealed to were not experiences, but rather you know, these, these sort of abstract uh, 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 thought experiments, and these ideas that did not connect in any way to, to any sort of sense experience. So they threw out th this sort of metaphysics uh, and instead wanted to focus simply on epistemology, focus on how it is that we come to know things rather than focusing on the fundamental structure of reality. And it, it's this kind of mentality that really helped lay the groundwork for modern science that I talked about in the, a, a few uh, videos back when I talked about the history and the development of, uh, of the scientific revolution. The second question that the empiricists asked were, what are the limits of human knowledge? Uh, what, what kind of instrument is the human mind? What, what is it equipped to know and what is simply beyond its grasp? Uh, you know, you know, even if there is such a thing as a sort of fundamental true nature of reality that is out there, do we have any reason for thinking that the human mind is capable of understanding it? Um, that, that might simply be biting off more than we can chew. Um, you know, just like a dog cannot understand calculus, the human mind simply might not be equipped to fully grasp the true nature of reality. The human mind is a tool, and like any other tool, it's really good at some things, not so good at others. It's really good at understanding experience, not so good at understanding the true nature of reality, according to the empiricists. So, so, so let's just sort of back away from talking about the true nature of reality and instead simply talk about uh, human experience. That was the direction that the empiricists wanted to go. So like I said, I want to focus principally on uh, John Locke, uh, since he is the father of British empiricism. And now Locke sort of uh, uh, set the stage, he felt, for, for all philosophers to come, and uh, that he thought that the job of the philosopher is to clear the field of rubbish, that was the phrase he used. And by rubbish, basically, he means metaphysics. He means all these sort of grand ideas of Plato and Descartes, uh, these massive metaphysical systems where they use reason alone to prove you know, the, the, the true nature of reality, to prove the existence of the forms or the existence of God, these sorts of confusing ideas he thought uh, uh, made made thinking just much more difficult. Um, it's you know not because Locke didn't believe in God. Locke did in fact believe in God, but he believed in God on the basis of experience. He thought you could prove God on, uh, uh, by looking at the evidence. Uh, and and so what a philosopher should do, according to Locke is look at these sort of confusing, complex ideas and break them down and say, okay, what's the evidence for this? What is the experiential grounding of this idea? Uh, and if you can't find one, throw it out. It's rubbish. So when we do that, you know, again, we, we look ba again back at people like Plato and Descartes, and, and, and they both argued, for example, that there are innate ideas, some ideas that are just hardwired into the human mind. Uh, typical examples here are things like uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That just seems something that all human beings with at least a sort of a minimal capacity to reason grasp the truth of 2 plus 2 equals 4, and they don't get this idea from experience. They, they get it just because it's, it's built into the nature of rationality itself. Uh, same thing with things like uh, a triangle has three sides, these sorts of notions. Uh, God is a perfect being, which is was one of Descartes' ideas. Uh, he thinks these things are just sort of built into the human consciousness, and Locke goes after this notion of innate ideas with a vengeance. He wants to demolish it, he wants to completely throw it out. And so he asked that, that, same, that first question I threw out on the last slide. How do you know? Okay, you claim this is an innate idea, how do you know? What's your evidence? How do you back up this idea that there is such a thing as an innate idea? Now, according to Locke, uh, you, you, you can't point to any idea that at all, that all human beings share, at least all human beings, you know, even with, with rational minds. No matter what idea it is that you point to, there will at least be some people who, again, smart, intelligent, not mentally handicapped or anything like that, grown up people who will not grasp that idea, who will not share that idea. Now, whether or not this is true is you know, actually something today that's a little bit more uh, contested. The anthropologists talk about human universals. Um, uh, Steve Pinker, 
in his book, Cites an Anthropologist, who lists, I think, like 370 human universals. Um, now, it's not clear that all those universals really qualify as innate ideas. Um, sometimes they're more like behaviors, dispositions, and things like that. Um, but, you know, long story short, it, it's not at all clear that, uh, that Locke was right here when he says that there is no evidence that there any ideas are innate. But I don't so much want to sort of uh, weigh into this notion, uh, weigh into this, the, the discussion of innate ideas here. I just want to put Locke's take on it uh, on the table. So Locke's famous idea, which you've probably heard of before, is called the, the tabula rasa, also known as the blank slate. This is an idea that, that sort of made its way into popular culture. Uh, Star Trek has played with this idea. The X-Files played with it. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, Dollhouse, which actually is a show I've just started watching myself, uh, plays with this idea uh, quite a lot. Uh, and the notion of the blank slate or the tabula rasa is the idea that we are born with an empty mind. There's, there's nothing in our mind at all, just an empty page. And sense experience imprints upon that empty page ideas, thoughts, um, so it's only through experience that we come to have any ideas at all. Uh, I'll, I think I can quote actually Locke directly here. We ask how the mind comes to be furnished. I answer in a word by experience. I think I, if I recall correctly, that actually is a direct quote from, from, from Locke. So, you know, so sort of visualize it here, you know, this idea that the brain at birth is just an empty slate. And, and, and the chalk of experience is, is where we get all of our ideas from. Uh, a thought experiment that probably helps here. This is a thought experiment from Robert Piercig in his book, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Man. It's one of my favorite books. Uh, it's the book that actually got me into philosophy which I, when I read it in high school. I highly recommend it to everyone. And This is his thought experiment to, to sort of capture this idea. He says, imagine that there's a person born with no sense modalities at all. They cannot see, they cannot taste, they cannot smell, they cannot touch, nothing. All of their sense modalities are cut off. Um, uh, they're, they're just sort of a, a brain isolated in the skull, and none of the information that you and I receive every second of every day, or almost every second of every day at least, uh, gets into their brain. So no sense experiences at all. Uh, and, and this person's like this from birth. So they've never had any sense experiences at all. Now let's say we keep this person alive through artificial hydration and nutrition, and then we get to their 21st birthday or their 30th birthday or whatever, you know, again, pick, pick, pick a number. We get to, to, to the, they've had a fairly long life, and we ask the following question. Does this person have a single thought in their head? Do they know anything? Now, a lot of people, Locke included, are inclined to say no. This person has no knowledge, no ideas, no thoughts at all. Because where would it come from? You know, in order to, it had to get in there somehow. And if this, if, if this brain is completely cut off, then there's simply no access to anything that it could think about. Uh, even if all the sort of other parts of the brain are working just fine, there's nothing to chew on, no raw material, as it were, for it to, for this person to think about. Like I said, not everyone is completely convinced of, by this line of thinking. Some people think, that, yeah, they do know something. I mean, maybe it's not something that can be captured in human language, because obviously that is learned, and, and, and because we are so such linguistic creatures, it's hard for us to sort of imagine what they might know, but some people have a fairly, a fairly strong intuition, at least, you know, that person would still know something. Um, so, like I said, again, this is just a thought experiment to sort of to try to get you thinking about this notion of the tabula rasa and where you stand on it. So, the, the tabula rasa theory leads us to a position known as sensationalism. It's, it's, very, it's, it's an idea that's very closely related to classical empiricism. Sensationalism is just this idea that, you know, like I said, it follows from, from, from the blank slate. The, the mind is a dry sponge. Sensations pour into the mind through the eyes, the ears, the skin, and the mind just sort of absorbs them in this way, and, and, and there as these experiences are imprinted onto our consciousness. Now, Modern psychology takes this to be kind of naive for reasons that hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll get around to later. But for now, I just want to mention that this sort of simplistic idea of the mind as a dry sponge, which just sort of absorbs information from the world around, uh, that it's not quite that easy. It's a little bit more sophisticated, a little more complicated than that. Um, but for now, I mean, again, we don't need to bother with that complication. Just sort of set that aside. 
Um, now, a problem with traditional empiricism is that it tends to lead to various forms of skepticism. Now, skepticism here is not probably what most of you are probably familiar with when you think about skepticism. It's not just sort of this general attitude of, of not accepting ideas uh, on say-so, not accepting ideas on faith, uh, but rather demanding a high standard of evidence and, and, and proof before you accept any claim. That sort of general epistemological attitude is, is, is one meaning of the word skepticism. But in this context, the word skepticism means you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a much more radical view. It's principled skepticism. The idea that we cannot have any knowledge at all, or, or in the very least, you know, we can know, know almost nothing, nothing that we really want to know. Uh, so I want to talk about two, two forms of skepticism here. The first is external world skepticism. Um, this is the idea that, you know, that we, we, we can never experience the world itself, and that means that we can never really know anything at all about the world. On uh, the second is inductive skepticism. Um, this is the idea that, you know, we, we never have experience of past and pre uh, so we only have experiences about the past and the present we never actually experience the future and that means that we can never know anything at all about the future we can never know for example that the sun will rise tomorrow um, now I I'll talk more about inductive skepticism when I talk about the problem of induction in the next uh, uh, section of this video series but I want to say something about external world skepticism because it's, it's one of these classic problems it's a problem that was probably mo made famous by Rene Descartes uh, and, and the problem here is the following. It seems like our, our minds are confined behind this, or again, what's called the veil of ideas. No matter what we do, we're always stuck inside of our own heads. We see through our eyes, we hear through our ears, we feel through our skin, and so forth. We can never step outside of our heads, so to speak, and just see the world the way it really is. So we get what's, what's sometimes called this notion of the Cartesian theater. And this, this image, I think, sort of portrays this idea do really nicely. It's kind of like there's a little homunculus, a little person stuck inside our head, getting the live feed from our eyes and hearing sound from our ears, and that person has no way of checking and verifying that what's being told by their eyes is the way things really are, and then what they're hearing with their ears is the way things really sound. Because they're stuck in their head like this, they can't escape this Cartesian theater to, 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 to verify, to check. And that means we've got no way of knowing that, the, the, uh, that if the world as it appears to us in our heads actually is the way the world is. And something like this, and maybe the, not this particular formulation of it, obviously again we don't have a little homunculus inside our head, but something like this does seem to be something of an inevitable problem for classical empiricism. Uh, you, you can sort of formalize the argument like this. Premise one is just the central core of empiricism. All knowledge comes from experience. Premise two, we never really experience the world itself. We simply experience sensations that come from the world. That's what our experiences are. It's not the world itself, it's sensations inspired by the world. And that means that we can never know anything at all about the world. We can only talk about our sense experiences. We can't talk about reality. We can't talk about nature. We can only talk about what we see and what we think. Now, if this holds, if we just bite this bullet, basically this will eviscerate all of science because we're no longer studying an objective nature. We're just studying patterns in our own subjective experiences. We're not talking about the way the world is. We're just talking about the way it looks to me and to you and hopefully maybe possibly even to us. But there's no reason to think that we have a special or privileged access to reality through our, our you know, unreliable senses. And that means we should sort of just give up all this pretense of science as being objective, as studying nature. Um, this seems like a pretty serious bullet to bite, and it's a, it's a standard problem for classical empiricism. And this is why Rene Descartes rejected empiricism and instead went towards a form of rationalism. And again, the debate between classical empiricism and classical rationalism is a long one and an interesting one, but it's not really the one I want to focus on today. Uh, instead, I want to be looking at where empiricism went in the late 19th and the early 20th century, in particular in the hands of a group known as the Vienna Circle.